From the late 1700s to around about 1830, England was gripped by a passion for the spectacle of bare knuckle fighting. Some historians of the period now call this boxing mania, a time when brewers, bakers and bricklayers rubbed their brawny shoulders with those of the well-heeled gentry and aristocracy, all clamouring side by side to witness the major matches and catch a glimpse of the celebrity fighters of the day. It was a sport that, even if only momentarily, brought together the various classes of English society in a mutual excitement. The bloody violence of the prize fight was a spectacle of pure manliness and stoic grit that they could all admire despite the other social and economic chasms between them. It was during this period that the major characters in the early development of the sport of boxing entered into the history books. Names like Jack Broughton, Gentleman John Jackson, Tom Cribb, Tom Spring and innovative pugilists like the Jewish Londoner Daniel Mendoza and the fighter, racehorse owner and eventually member of parliament John Gully. Among these immortal names, however, are others with still more incredible life stories. Their biographies are true tales of escape from seemingly insurmountable burdens, from poverty, from racism, and even from the horrors of slavery itself. These men, Bill Richmond being the first, and Tom Molyneux, his one-time protege, truly bucked the odds to make it in a hostile world set against them on account of their race. Tom Molyneux was another African-American who made his name in the English bare knuckle prize ring in the early 1800s. What is known about much of his life has been pieced together from a fragmented collection of fight reports in old newspapers and from histories of prize fighting written around the time of Molyneux's life or in the years soon after. Unfortunately, what all of these sources have in common, however, is their unreliability. His birthplace is variously said to have been in Maryland, South Carolina, New York or Virginia, in fact, Virginia is listed as his birthplace on his Wikipedia page and despite any evidence to prove this, it seems as likely a place as any other. What we do know is that Molyneux was born somewhere in the southeastern United States around the year 1784, give or take a year or two. Some historians of boxing have claimed that Molyneux came from a well-known fighting family with a father and uncle who had made names for themselves in American fights. Others have claimed that he was trained in the British art and science of boxing by an English sailor in America who travelled with him to New York and arranged rudimentary fights for small winnings. Both of these claims have never been substantiated with any hard evidence, so it's fair to say they are, as it stands, nothing more than guesses about his early life. Writers at the time reported that Molyneux himself claimed to be an ex-slave who had won his freedom by winning fights against other slaves and against white men in his home country. This may well have been true, or it may have been an exaggerated story told to fascinated English fight fans in order to make a name for himself in a new and unknown country. Regardless, it seems likely that around 1804, Tom Molyneux was already in New York and may well have been living in the seedy Catherine Slip area of the city, a shipping district bustling with sailors from all corners of the world and alive with the rough and ready commotion of thousands of dock labourers who toiled in all weathers among the mountains of wooden crates, casks and barrels from the British Empire and beyond. Eventually, Molyneux decided that a life on the dangerous New York wharves was not for him, and he soon braved the treacherous Atlantic waters aboard a ship bound for England. Again, the history of his sea passage is mostly conjecture. Some say he stowed away, others that he brought his ticket with money won from fighting, and others still that he simply earned his passage to England by enlisting as a crewman, a theory which is not unlikely. When he left for England, he was already calling himself the Champion of America, although no such title existed as boxing had not yet developed as a sport in the United States. Molyneux arrived in England in the winter of 1809, after a number of days in England, he made his way to the pub and boxing venue owned by another extraordinary black American fighter named Bill Richmond. Richmond had also escaped slavery in the US and had made his name in English bare knuckle prize fighting before becoming a somewhat respected black celebrity in England. His pub and fight venue, the Horse and Dolphin, was the popular haunt of high society gentlemen and uneducated Londoners alike. 
Molyneux, fresh as he was to the city, knew that he had to seek the tutelage and support of the famous Bill Richmond if he was ever to make it in the prize ring. Richmond swiftly took Molyneux under his wing. He gave him lodgings at the Horse and Dolphin and soon agreed to train the young, unrefined fighter. However, what Richmond initially saw did not impress him. Molyneux knew nothing of the English style of boxing and instead relied on the American method of fighting with little finesse and the use of blows and holds considered far outside of the accepted rules of British boxing. He was a street fighter, a tough and powerful man for sure, but one who needed sculpting. Richmond set about training his new man, focusing on jabbing and the use of simple, com simple combinations and defensive moves. Soon enough, Richmond scored Molyneux his first real bare-knuckle contest. The English champion Tom Cribb had, a, had approached Richmond, a man he had fought himself, offering to match the new American with his own trainee, a fighter named Jack Burrows. Both sides agreed on a purse of £50, a handsome prize for a novice, and set the venue as Toothill Fields in the city of Westminster. The fight was held on July the 24th, 1810, to a modest crowd of 300. Burroughs was around 6 foot and 210 pounds, while Molyneux was 5 foot 8 and slightly lighter, but visibly more muscular. Early in the fight, Molyneux got to holding Burroughs and throwing punches with the bottom of his fist in a clubbing motion not seen in the English ring. He also threw some devastatingly hard blows with both hands, with his power more than making up for his lack of technique. The brutal engagement dragged on for nearly an hour, with Molyneux mostly dominating Burroughs but being unable to end the fight against his impressively tough opponent. Eventually, Cribb threw in the sponge over the ropes to signal the end of the fight and concede de uh, defeat for his man. The win hadn't been a spectacular one, but Molyneux had his first victory on British soil and had proved his intimidating power and toughness. One writer exclaimed after the fight, Molyneux punished his opponent so severely that it was impossible to distinguish a single feature in his face. Perhaps more importantly, Lord George Sackville had been among the fans at ringside and swiftly offered his own financial backing to Molyneux if he ever agreed to face the English champion, Tom Cribb. The prospect of fighting the champion after one fight must have seemed far-fetched to both Molyneux and Bill Richmond, but the fates would eventually bring these two warriors together. Back at the Horse and Dolphin, Molyneux began to enjoy some newfound fame and notoriety. The patrons of the pub came by in large numbers to meet the new and exotic foreign fighter. His confident and exuberant personality won him many new admirers and not a few jealous critics, and he swiftly made the most of his new popularity among the London ladies. Back in the training rooms attached to his pub, Richmond continued training Molyneux in the use of footwork, his guard and defensive moves, and his basic punching technique. Next up, Molyneux was challenged by Tom Blake, also known as Tom Tough. Blake had made a solid reputation as a fighter after going one and a half hours in battle against the champion Cribb. He had also gone a brutal 60 rounds against a fighter called Jack Holmes and was well known to fight enthusiasts as a dangerous man in the ring with incredible fortitude. Even at the age of 40, Blake, having been at sea for some years, was as tough as nails and potentially a frightening opponent for the novice American. Richmond demanded a purse of 100 guineas and Tom Cribb stepped in to lend Blake the money. All sides met at the Castle Tavern in London to agree to the purse and set the location as Apple Bay in Birchington-on-Sea near Margate on August the 21st, 1810. It was a swelteringly hot summer's day when Molyneux and Blake met with a crowd of at least 6,000 waiting on the turf with anticipation to see the exciting American newcomer. In fact, as a black man and a, fight, a foreigner to England, most were likely to be hoping to see him beaten by the homegrown man. In the first round, Molyneux began by popping the jab and throwing punches from range, a new skill he had obviously developed through the coaching of Bill Richmond. On occasion, Molyneux still threw his bizarre so-called hammer punch using the base of his fist to bludgeon Blake. However, Richmond scolded him with some choice words back in the corner between rounds and the borderline legal punch was not seen again. Twice, Molyneux knocked Blake clear to the ground with hard right hand punches. 
By the eighth round, the fight was all over when Molyneux apparently held Blake beneath his left arm while pummeling him with blows to the face with his right. So impressive was Molyneux's power and ability to take punishment that boxing writer Henry Downs Miles later wrote, in this battle, Molyneux evinced greater improvement in the science of pugilism, particularly in the art of giving, while nature seemed to have endowed him abundantly with the gift of taking, his body being almost callous to fistic punishment. After this impressive victory, Bill Richmond, Tom Molyneux, and almost everyone in the crowd that day agreed that the time had come for Molyneux to challenge the English champion, Tom Cribb. When the fight came off, it would be one of the most important in boxing history, with English xenophobia and racism creating a huge interest in the fight that pitched a foreign black man against a champion of English and therefore world boxing. Throughout the following weeks, Richmond continuously goaded Cribb into fighting his man, but Cribb maintained that he had retired from the prize ring. Meanwhile, reports were that Molyneux was enjoying his time avidly spending his recent winnings in the brothels and public houses of London, as well as on fine clothes. Little wonder, considering the poverty and repression he had contended with all of his life until this point. Molyneux's training apparently began to suffer, and it seemed to some that he was squandering his opportunity to make history and upset not just the English fighting world, but a whole nation unprepared to accept the superiority of a black athlete. Finally, Cribb caved to the constant needling from Richmond. In the autumn of 1810, he agreed to fight Molyneux on the condition that he be given ample training time and a substantial purse of 200 guineas per fighter. The date was set for December the 18th, 1810, at Copthorn Common, about 25 miles from London. Immediately, the announcement of the bout ignited the imagination of English men, women and children all over the country. As one writer had it, in clubs and sporting taverns, on the stock exchange and in the village alehouses, amongst West End swells and East End roughs, nothing was talked about but the fight between Cribb and Molyneux. Both fighters travelled to the venue the night before, with Molyneux and Richmond staying at the Dorset Arms pub. On the morning of the fight, a wintry rainstorm hammered the fields where the bout was to take place. The ground was soggy and a bitingly harsh wind blew the icy rain sideways. Nevertheless, some 10,000 hardy spectators squelched onto the battlefield and gathered around the outer ropes that separated the crowd some 15 feet from the main ring. Molyneux arrived in a horse-drawn carriage and walked to the ring to an eerie quiet as the crowd sized up the monster from overseas who had come to take glory from England. When Cribb finally arrived, the crowd erupted in cheers. At ringside were the umpires Lord Archibald Harrison and Colonel Barton, and inside the ropes was the referee Sir Thomas Apreece. The prize-fighting world of the 1800s had become the special domain of the rich and powerful. At noon sharp, time was called and the fight of the decade was on. Both men came out defensively with some jabbing and light sparring to size up their opponent and gauge the distance. In the second round, Molyneux drew first blood as one of his shots caused a nosebleed for Cribb. English fans would often bet on who would take first blood and so a noisy excitement rippled through some quarters of the crowd. From the third to the seventh rounds, Cribb was very much in charge of the action, although both men gave and took some nasty punishment. In the ninth round, Molyneux suddenly sent Cribb crashing to the ground after a prol prolonged flurry of shots and a hard right hook. With the crowd stunned, Cribb was dragged slowly to his feet and back to his corner. By the 18th round, both men were badly beaten and their faces were a horrible sight testament to the sheer brutality of the bare knuckle era of English boxing. In round 19, Molyneux leaned heavily on Cribb and held him hard against the ropes with both hands. Suddenly, the crowd rushed forward and tried to prise Molyneux's hands from the ropes and free the Englishman, breaking the American's fingers in the melee. From rounds 20 to 25, it was now Molyneux in charge of the action as he pressed home with attacks and absorbed some of the best that Cribb had to give. Then one of the most controversial and shameful events in the history of boxing occurred. By the old rules of bare knuckle prize fighting, each fighter was allotted 30 seconds in which to recover between rounds. 
If he failed to make it to the scratch mark at the center of the ring in time, he was deemed the loser. In the 28th or 29th round, Crib was downed and dragged back to his corner. To all onlookers, he was a beaten man. The 30 seconds was counted down. Crib remained on his stall in the corner. His seconds yelled at Molyneux. They yelled at the judges and the referee. Their plan was to distract the officials and stall for time, giving their jaded man more time to recover. By the rules, the fight was over and Molyneux was the new champion of England. A black American should have worn the English boxing crown. But the scam worked. Crib was brought to the scratch and the fight somehow continued. Richmond, as a black foreigner himself, surrounded by 10,000 English fans, had little choice but to accept the con that was unfolding before him. By the 40th round, after 55 minutes of blood-drenched fighting, Molyneux was no longer able to stand and had to concede the fight. Cribb had retained his claim to the English Championship through grit, strength and the dirty, ignominious shenanigans of his cornermen. After the fight, when Cribb had returned to Bristol, and Molyneux was back in London, Richmond set about challenging Cribb to a rematch. His letters calling out the champion were published in the main newspapers of the day and dropped very subtle hints about his unhappiness with the way the fight was officiated. Meanwhile, Molyneux was now propelled into a new level of fame and celebrity. Not only was he often swarmed at the horse and dolphin, by fascinated fans that he was soon invited to the London Stock Exchange, where the wealthy brokers gifted him 50 guineas for his performance. He began to hold sparring exhibitions at a boxing venue in London called the Fives Court, with over 1,000 paying spectators at a time. But the early bare knuckle world was a merciless one, and exhibition bouts didn't pay the bills. So next, Molyneux stepped in the ring again against a fighter called Rimmer. The fight was on May 21, 1811, and was a one-sided drubbing with Molyneux beating Rimmer around the ring in front of 20,000 spectators. At one point, the hostile crowd broke the ring and a small riot erupted as they desperately tried to stop the black man from beating the white English challenger. As one writer witnessed it, peers and plowmen, fighting men and chimney sweeps, costermongers were all in one tumultuous uproar. After about 20 minutes, order was restored and Molyneux continued the sad spectacle of thrashing his opponent until he could no longer be made to stand after 15 rounds of punishment. Once again, Molyneux had proved his ability despite the attempts by the crowd to sway the outcome. But his exploits in England went unmentioned back in his native America. The public there was yet to catch on to the craze for boxing and besides were apparently little interested in the victories of a black man. Eventually, Cribb met with Bill Richmond and Molyneux at the Horse and Dolphin. He agreed to a rematch and demanded 300 guineas a side, a huge sum for the day, along with a 25-foot raised ring with the fight taking place no more than 100 miles from London. All sides agreed to the rematch and the deal was signed. In a first in the history of boxing, Cribb then travelled to the estate of Captain Barclay in Uri, Scotland to begin a training camp, something now routine with all fighters. Barclay was a famous athlete himself who had made his name after having walked a thousand miles in a thousand days, eating and sleep a thousand hours, eating and sleeping as he walked. In Uri he subjected Crib to a healthy diet, to runs and long walks in the Scottish Hills, to strength training and to regular sparring. This was revolutionary for the time, with most bare knuckle pugilists simply relying on pure talent and determination and a swig of strong gin between rounds. In contrast, Molyneux and Richmond were forced to embark on an exhibition tour to make enough money to pay for the fight purse, travelling all over England to exhibit in town halls and public houses. The second Crib vs Molyneux fight had fast become a national event. Newspapers across the country printed updates and opinions and the same question still persisted, summed up by a writer at the time, whether Old England should still retain her proud characteristic of conquering or that an American and a man of colour should win the honour, wear it and carry it away from the shores of Britain. Molyneux and Cribb made their way to Thistleton Gap on September 28, 1811. Over 20,000 fans were jammed into the meadow that made for the venue. At 18 minutes past noon, time was called and the much-awaited rematch began. Again, eager punters cheered when they saw that Molyneux drew first blood early in the fight. 
but most English fans became concerned, especially when the champion's left eye began to swell and close. In the fifth round, Cribb was floored with a ferocious shot to the head from Molyneux. However, in the sixth, it was Molyneux's turn to taste the earth as a body shot doubled him up and sent him down. Even before the blow, Molyneux was out of breath and struggling against a relentless Cribb. In the ninth round, Molyneux suffered yet more painful punishment when Cribb broke his jaw with a combination of hard punches. In the 11th round, after 19 minutes of a sometimes gruesome beating, Molyneux was unable to regain his feet and the fight was over. Cribb was once again the victor and this time with no interference from his seconds or the crowd. In the days that followed, Molyneux and Richmond's relations broke down and they parted ways. Molyneux took to doing exhibitions, tours around England and even wrestling at city fairs, anything to maintain his name and reputation and put much needed money in his notoriously shallow pockets. From the depression of defeat and his split from Richmond, not to mention the racial hostility he received as a part of daily life, Molyneux slipped further into the bad habits of drinking and womanising. His muscular physique deteriorated and his boxing skills rusted. Even Richmond soon attempted to have him jailed over a debt he owed before the matter was eventually solved. On April the 12th, 1813, Molyneux faced Jack Carter in Gloucestershire. According to accounts, the fight was a sad spectacle, with neither man showing much in the way of skill or physical conditioning. After 25 rounds, Molyneux took the hollow victory, but much of the crowd had already left. Soon after, Molyneux travelled to Scotland and continued his exhibition tour, making some respectable profits in the process. In what was to be his last competitive bare-knuckle contest, he accepted a challenge from one of Bill Richmond's new trainees, William Fuller. For 100 guineas aside, and in an extraordinarily large 40-foot ring set up in Paisley, the two began the contest. Not long into the match, the local police constables arrived and broke it up, so the fight had to be continued some days later. The second contest lasted 68 minutes, with incredibly only two rounds being fought. Neither man was strong enough to knock the other down. As Molyneux continued his tour of Scotland following the Fuller fight, his poor physical condition was clear for all to see. It is entirely likely, sadly, that he was already suffering from the ravages of consumption, or tuberculosis, and was by this point a dying man. With his opportunities for money-making in Scotland exhausted, Molyneux crossed the infamously rough waters of the Irish Sea and continued his touring anew in Ireland. Here he also made a meagre living, giving boxing lessons in venues around Galway. It was here that he spent his last days, as poverty and disease slowly took their toll on the once intimidatingly powerful American prize fighter. On a cool Irish night in August in 1818, Molyneux died in the barrack rooms he shared with three black soldiers. He wasn't yet 40 years old. Tom Molyneux's life story is important for a number of reasons. He survived against the odds, escaping a country where black people were enslaved in horrifying numbers and surviving the treacherous sea voyage to a foreign and unknown land. He became one of the first international sporting stars in American history. He became one of the first black celebrities in Britain, at the time the world's foremost superpower. But just as important as this, his life story is a mirror through which we see the ugly aspects of human history reflected back at us. The everyday prejudice, the denial of his victories on account of his race, the way he was used as a symbol of perverse ideas of the white race versus the black race. Perhaps it is through the life stories of extraordinary men like Tom Molyneux that we can appreciate and respect the hardships endured by even supposedly free black people in the past. Tom Molyneux was not just an exceptional black American, he was an exceptional American, but the newspapers and writers of his time were conspicuously silent on his achievements. Rocky has a statue in Philadelphia, but Rocky is a fictional movie character who never existed. Molyneux was one of the first American international sports stars, but you'd be hard pushed to find an overgrown plaque in his honour in the United States, let alone a statue.